year 1504, a young priest and scholar from Rotterdam, whose father also happens to be a priest, visits the Abbey of Park near Louvain in what is now Belgium. On the shelves of its library, he finds a manuscript, not an ancient manuscript because it's only about 50 years old. It turns out to be a series of notes that had been written in Rome in the Vatican in the 1440s and 1450s by a strange and controversial but undoubtedly brilliant character named Lorenzo Valla. Val had never had the work published and the manuscript existed in only a few copies, one of which found its way into the Abbey Library. But in 1504, this copy fell into the right hands. The priest who found it was electrified by what he saw because Valla had written out some 2000 corrections to the Latin text of the New Testament. His great expertise in Latin and Greek meant he could give a far better and more accurate reading of certain of the New Testament's words and phrases, in effect challenging or questioning the thousand-year-old translation of St. Jerome. The priest who found the manuscript got the work published in the following year, and a great genie came out of the bottle. Who was this priest who discovered Valla's manuscript? He was on his way to becoming, if anything, an even greater scholar. He was Desiderius Erasmus of Rotterdam. Hello and welcome. I'm Ross King. This is Renaissance Discoveries. And in this video, I want us to look at the discovery or rediscovery in the 1400s of the Bible. I want us to look at how and why a number of scholars in Italy, some of these brainiacs who I discuss in my other videos, used their sharp eyes and well-honed linguistic skills to correct St. Jerome's translation of the Bible, and how these close textual readings ultimately had momentous and far-reaching consequences. First of all, let's look at the text of the Bible as it would have existed in Western Europe in the 1400s and early 1500s. The biblical text in use was the Vulgate, the Latin version completed more than a thousand years earlier by St. Jerome. In 382 AD, Pope Damasus commissioned Jerome to produce a new Latin version of the Bible to correct and improve the older Latin translations done a century or two earlier. Jerome translated the biblical text from Greek and Hebrew, but he also used and corrected these various older Latin translations. And his version gradually, but by no means immediately, eclipsed them. The name Vulgate is a reference to the fact that Jerome's translation in time was commonly known or used because Vulgate comes from the Latin vulgus, the common people, from which we get words like vulgar and also expressions such as the vulgar tongue, meaning the language of the common people. Over the centuries, the Vulgate was reproduced by scribes in loads of copies, many thousands of them. But of course, there was a problem with there being so many copies, because many of them, in fact, all of them, differed from each other. No two copies of the Vulgate were the same. It's been estimated, in fact, from extant copies produced in the centuries after Jerome and before the invention of the printing press in the middle of the 1400s, that there were more than 100,000 textual variants, more than 100,000 places, that is, in these manuscript Bibles, where if we look at another manuscript Bible, in fact, any other manuscript Bible, we find a different set of words and phrases at some point, or missing passages, or added passages, and so forth. It's not hard to see why various errors would have crept into a manuscript copy of a Bible. A manuscript was the product of an individual scribe or group of scribes at a particular point in time, copying out the product of another scribe who was copying the work of yet another scribe and so forth. 
In the decades and centuries, manuscripts therefore came to be filled with errors and inaccuracies that had been, for the most part, accidentally introduced and then compounded as one flawed manuscript begat an even worse version. The Bible might be the word of God, but it was copied out by men, by scribes with tired eyes working in poor light with aching backs and wavering concentration, often on manuscripts that were old and difficult to read, sometimes written in a different and unfamiliar centuries-old handwriting. Various efforts have been made over the centuries to eliminate the errors and to standardize the text of Jerome's Bible. Efforts by, for example, Alcuin of York, who revised the Vulgate, trying to purge it of 400 years worth of errors. This is a copy made of one of his new and improved versions produced at the Benedictine Abbey of Saint Martin in Tours in about 830 AD, a Bible that, despite its beauty, nonetheless contains, over the course of its 900 pages, the inevitable scribal error, like all other manuscripts. 400 years after Alcuin, Bibles based on his revisions were used in Paris to establish a kind of new standard for the Bible, what are known as the Paris Bibles, the Bibles produced in the 1200s, beginning about 1230, largely for theological students and lay people, rather than as previously for monks because by the 1200s were in the period of the founding of the universities, including the one in Paris. These Bibles represented a revision to the Vulgate, i.e. to Jerome's Bible, insofar as they changed the order of the books of the Bible, giving it more or less the order we have today. And they also introduced things such as chapter divisions, making it user-friendly for students but they didn't really tinker with the text of the translation itself. There was a kind of quality control with the Paris Bibles because they were based on corrections made by theologians at the University of Paris to the manuscripts that they had inherited and studied and emended. But of course, since these Paris Bibles were produced on a larger scale than ever before, errors and variant readings were inevitable. By the time we advance 200 more years and get to the 1400s, scholars begin to realize that there is another problem with the Bible. In Italy at this time, there was a group of scholars who in their studies of, for example, the literature of ancient Greece and Rome, wanted to go back as close as possible to the original sources. For example, if they read Aristotle, which they did, they didn't want to read a translation of Aristotle that had been made from Arabic into Latin based on one translated from Syriac into Arabic based on one translated from Greek into Syriac, which is how the medieval Latin West in the 1200s got most of their Aristotle. That is through a succession of translations from one language into another a process by which there was obviously huge room for multiple errors as things became quite literally lost in translation. So they wanted to go back in the case of Aristotle, for example, to the original Greek. When they came to the Bible, they realized that the problem was not just scribes accidentally copying out the wrong word. They realized that in order to have an accurate version of the Bible, they needed to do more than just get a clean, error-free copy of St. Jerome's original Vulgate, something that was a thousand years after Jerome pretty much impossible. They recognized that Jerome was human and therefore fallible, that he may have used dodgy sources or error-filled manuscripts, and the good ones he had, he may have translated incorrectly out of Greek or Hebrew. They therefore wanted to know how reliable Jerome's original translation had been, how close it was to the Greek and Hebrew originals with which he had worked. To find out and to create 
a better translation, they believed that they had to go back beyond the Vulgate, beyond Jerome, to investigate the sources on which he based his translation of the Bible. That is, back to the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts, the older the better. The other thing that troubled these scholars was that the Vulgate wasn't always particularly elegant and graceful in its language, especially if you compare its language to the Latin of, say, Cicero, who was writing in Latin in the century before the Gospels were written down in Greek. In the 14th century, the poet and scholar Petrarch wrote that nothing was sweeter or more healthful than the Gospels, but he also regretted that they were somewhat crude and uncouth in their language. And he's speaking of Jerome's translation of the Vulgate because Petrarch did not speak Greek. So would it be possible, these scholars wondered, a thousand years after Jerome to produce an entirely new translation of the Bible, one that was more elegant in its language and reliable in its sources? By the 1400s, the time was right for this sort of forensic investigation. These Italian scholars had developed great skills in textual criticism. They had interest and expertise in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and experience editing ancient manuscripts, many of which had recently been rediscovered. These scholars possessed resources that earlier theologians in the West had lacked, specifically a knowledge of Greek. In order to study the authority of Jerome's translations, scholars needed to know and read the languages in which the Bible was written, Hebrew and Aramaic for the Old Testament, Greek for the New. Learning Hebrew was not all that difficult, logistically at least. Jewish communities could be found throughout Europe, and so knowledge of Hebrew and also Aramaic had never disappeared in, say, Italy or France. And it was perfectly possible, as we shall see, for someone in Italy, in Florence, for example, to get instruction either from Jews or from Jewish converts to Christianity. And in fact, one of the main reasons Christians learned Hebrew was, such was the anti-Semitism of the times, to convert the Jews to Christianity. Greek, though, had been a different story. As I discuss in my dramatic and exciting video on the rediscovery of Plato, almost no one in the West could read Greek during the Middle Ages, or at least not ancient Greek to the level necessary to study the Greek texts of Plato or the New Testament. It was not until 1397, February the 2nd, 1397 to be exact, that it suddenly became possible in the West to study Greek with a capable and even brilliant teacher, a teacher named Manuel Chrysoloris, who was invited to come from Constantinople to Florence to teach Greek to students at the local university, the Studio Fiorentino. Chrysoloris therefore gave the key to Greek learning to the Florentines, and the Florentines in turn would pass on this key so that most of the scholars in Italy in the 1400s who knew Greek, and there came to be many of them, had learned it either from Chrysoloris himself or from his students. These students went on to become great translators of Plato and Aristotle, among others, and also of the church fathers. One of Chrysoloris' students in Florence was a monk named Ambrogio Traversari, a brilliant linguist who translated early Christian writers such as St. Basil and St. John Chrysostom from Greek into Latin. Traversari passed on his knowledge of Greek because he taught a young man named Gianozzo Minetti. Minetti, like Traversari, is one of the new types of scholars who I've been referring to. He was an interesting character, someone who combined scholarship with a glittering career as a public official and ambassador. He was extremely wealthy. His father was a banker and one of the wealthiest men in Florence, but he was also extremely pious and he was also extraordinarily brilliant, especially as a linguist. 
the great Manetti Wilf actually inhibited Genozzo's studies because his father, like many fathers perhaps, many successful fathers, wanted his son to follow in his footsteps and become a businessman and take over the family business, something that Genozzo had limited interest in. And so he was put to work counting the family wealth. And it wasn't until he was in his 20s that he could truly begin his studies. Some of his studies are unconventional. It's said that he picked up and perfected his Latin by hanging out on Florence's street corners and piazzas, listening to debates, which tells us something about the exalted level of debate in Florence in the 1420s and 1430s. Besides learning Latin on the street corners and Greek from Traversari, Manetti studied Hebrew, availing himself of the resources of the Jewish community in Florence. Like many Christians, he wanted to convert the Jews to Christianity, and he had some success in this endeavor since he apparently converted a young Jewish scholar who he then took into his home as a tutor giving himself a kind of Hebrew immersion course. The young man would only speak to him, only address him in Hebrew. Besides studying the Hebrew language, by the early 1440s, Manetti was reading the Old Testament and Hebrew Bible with various Jewish scholars in Florence. He was also collecting Hebrew manuscripts. His collection was of such quality that it now forms the nucleus of the Hebrew collection in the Vatican Library. He owned an entire Hebrew Bible, as well as copies of the Psalms and many commentaries by Jewish scholars. Manetti was undoubtedly conducting his studies with a plan beyond simply converting Florence's Jewish community. That is, he wanted to make an entirely new translation of the Bible, the first such attempt in a thousand years. He got his chance when one of his fellow students from the days when he studied Greek under Traversari, another brilliant scholar named Tommaso Parentucelli got an important job. He became Pope, Pope Nicholas V, the man who is known to history as the first Renaissance Pope. He's known as a Renaissance Pope because he was restoring Rome to its former architectural grandeur and also because he was sponsoring many scholars, turning the Vatican into a haven for scholarship and learning. Pope Nicholas gave his old school friend Minetti the job of papal secretary and in about 1453 commissioned him to make a new translation of the Bible what Minetti claimed would be a new translation of both the Old and New Testament into the Latin language, made partly from the Hebrew and partly from the Greek language, as they were, from the beginning, handed down by their own authors in their writings. Minetti's project was cut short by what he called the untimely and cruel death of Pope Nicholas in 1455. He didn't get to use his expertise in Hebrew on the Old Testament, apart from translating the Psalms, but he did produce a new translation of the entire New Testament, the first new Latin translation of the New Testament in more than a thousand years. Minetti was governed by two motives, the two motives I've been talking about, one to find better sources and two to improve the literary style of the Vulgate, to turn it into more elegant Latin. For his sources, fortunately, he had at his disposal his friend Vespasiano da Bistici, the bookseller of Florence. And if I can be permitted some shameless product placement at this point, I bring to your attention this riveting masterpiece of scholarship and storytelling available in all good bookstores. Vespasiano was the great manuscript dealer in Florence, the greatest in Europe, an incredibly knowledgeable and well-resourced merchant of knowledge who could find any text that you wanted, including Greek manuscripts of the Old Testament. Minetti, who was in Rome at this time, wrote to Vespasiano asking for help with biblical sources, and Vespasiano found a number for him, such as this one, which is from the 11th century, or this one from the 14th century, a Greek manuscript of the Gospels produced in Constantinople, 
with the Gospel of St. John, which we see here, beginning with this remarkable abstract decoration at the top of the page. Manetti also had a copy of the Vulgate, possibly likewise found for him by Vespasiano. And so he sat down with all of his various manuscripts sitting side by side by side by side, combing through them for what seemed the best and most accurate reading, which he then gave in his elegant humanistic Latin. Once Manetti was finished with his translation, Vespasiano produced this beautiful illuminated copy of it for the Duke of Urbino, Federico de Montefeltro, who had a magnificent library in his palazzo. Here we see the wonderful decorations as well as the very clear legible script pioneered in Florence in the 1400s. Manetti appears to have had one other important source available to him, and that was the series of notes written on the New Testament by another one of his contemporaries, another official at the papal court, Lorenzo Valla. Valla was probably an even more adept scholar and linguist than Minetti, probably one of the two or three greatest classical scholars of the century. He was certainly the greatest philologist of his age, that is, the most adept scrutineer of written records and historical sources. He understood better than anyone else at the time how language was historically constructed, and that in order to understand the meaning of words and documents, you needed to know their historical context and the evolution that they had through time. He was the man, for instance, who used his knowledge of Latin to expose the donation of Constantine as a forgery. This donation was an imperial decree supposedly written by the Emperor Constantine in 315 AD, giving the papacy authority over vast territories of the Roman Empire. Valla used his knowledge of Latin and of church history to rip this document apart. He showed how it was full of amateurish errors and stupid anachronisms that meant it couldn't possibly have been written in 315 AD and that it was therefore a fake and that Constantine had not therefore given all that land to the church. What reason would there be for writing, Valla once asked, if not to correct errors or omissions? And it was this kind of forensic scrutiny, this ability to sift through and x-ray old texts that Valla then used to study the New Testament. We should imagine people in the Vatican taking a big gulp at the prospect of Valla turning his attention to the Bible. He was a controversial character, and not only because of his demolition of the donation of Constantine. One of his contemporaries, Poggio Bracciolini, called him a delusional and demented lunatic. That's a bit harsh, but modern scholars, while admiring his brilliance, have also recoiled from his incredibly intemperate nastiness. Recently, an editor of one of his works described him as a man with a cruel pen, titanic confidence, and odious self-regard. And this gargoyle-like image of Allah does make him look like he has bitten a few noses in his day. In defense of Valla, he had a lot to be arrogant about. In a century of brilliant spirits, he was pretty much tops in terms of intellectual firepower and fearless originality. Anyway, in the 1440s and 1450s, Valla collected together a number of Greek manuscripts of the Bible that had recently turned up in Rome and Milan, and he then worked on improving the Vulgate. He didn't make a new translation like Minetti, rather he made a whole series of annotations and corrections, some 2,000 of them, pointing out what he regarded as mistakes in Jerome's translation. Like Minetti, he was concerned with establishing an authentic and accurate text, but also one that was more elegant and literary, more refined than the language of Jerome.
we might look at Minetti and Valla as literary snobs who wanted to elevate the tone of the Bible to make it more sophisticated and Ciceronian, redolent of the language of the Augustan age of Rome. Valla was certainly obsessed with correct and elegant Latin, with purifying Latin of what he regarded as the ugly words and phrases that over the centuries had grown over classical Latin like a kind of dirty crust, on all of which I refer you to my video on the Renaissance discovery of Latin. He and Minetti were really concerned with aesthetics more than with dogma. They treated the Bible crucially like any other literary text, the same way they would have treated a poem by Ovid or Virgil, except of course they didn't think the Bible was necessarily as good in terms of its style as Ovid or Virgil, and they therefore wanted to tart it up a bit and make it more palatable to refined literary types such as themselves. However, they were concerned ultimately with accuracy. Their aim was to recover and restore the original meaning of the Bible by putting the biblical text in their full historical and linguistic context. And remember, this is something at which Vala excels more than anyone else to this point in history. For example, he felt that if you were talking about the three persons of the Trinity, you had to understand the historical meaning of the Greek word for person, prosopon. And for this reason, he believed the philologist or grammarian could have a, an understanding of the Bible that was superior to that of the theologian, because the theologian was dependent on the knowledge of the grammarian or linguist about the language in which the Bible was originally written. It's revealing to look at Vala's impassioned defense of what he was doing. If I am correcting anything, I am not correcting sacred scripture, but rather its translation. And in doing so, I'm not being insolent towards scripture, but rather pious. And I am doing nothing more than translating better than the earlier translator. At various points, for example, in Corinthians, Vala would say things such as, the fault lies not with St. Paul, but with the translator. It was Jerome's fault, not St. Paul's. Maybe inevitably, as Vala corrected mistakes in the Vulgate, some of his comments strayed into areas of dogma. The most famous and important example is 1 Corinthians 15.10. In this passage, Paul is talking modestly about how he is the least of the apostles and doesn't deserve the name, because back in the day he, of course, persecuted Christians. But he then throws modesty to the winds and notes that he worked harder than all the other apostles. But the credit for all this hard work and success, the Vulgate seems to suggest, goes in part to the grace of God. The Vulgate reads, non ego autem sed gratia de mecum, not I, however, but the grace of God with me. Theologians had therefore developed the concept of gratia cooperans, cooperating grace. The individual worked in tandem with the grace of God. Paul had become such a great apostle, that is, thanks to a kind of cooperation between himself and God's grace. But Vala, based on words included in his Greek texts, translated the passage differently. Non ego autem sed gratia de que est mecum. Not I, however, but the grace of God that is with me. This might seem like splitting hairs, but the Greek text, which Vala took to be more authoritative, does not speak of God's grace cooperating with St. Paul, but rather it gives credit for all success to the work of grace alone. Paul has no share in it. Vala therefore believed that theologians had been misled by the Vulgate. He wrote that they say nothing who call this the cooperative grace of God, for Paul does not attribute this to himself, but referred all grace received 
to God. This opens or complicates the question, what's going to become a hot button topic in the following century, of whether we find salvation through God's grace or through our own merit, or whether through some combination of the two, as in John Wesley's much later statement that God helps those who help themselves. Bala died in 1457, and his manuscript languished, as did Manetti's translation of the New Testament, neither of which was published in the 1400s. The Vulgate, however, was published. It was published in about 1455 by Johannes Gutenberg and Johannes Fust, the famous Gutenberg Bible. There were then about 100 more printed editions of the Vulgate produced across Europe by 1500. So this prolific transmission meant the Vulgate might have seemed to be safe. But then at last we arrive at the Abbey of Park in 1504, when Erasmus found Valla's notes and a year later published them, and then, inspired by Valla's example, began preparing his own Latin translation of the New Testament, using as many ancient manuscripts as he could find. Like Valla, he defended himself by saying that he wanted to make it easier for us to possess the Bible in a purer form and to understand it better. He spent more than a decade on the task, and his New Testament naturally proved controversial when it was finally published in 1516, even though he took the precaution of dedicating the translation to Pope Leo X. He was accused, though, of laying profane hands on the word of God, of tinkering with the sacred text. He noted that theologians claimed that it is an intolerable insolence that the grammarian, having molested all other disciplines, does not restrain his impudent pen from the Holy Scripture. But there was more. Let's go back to Valla's dismissal of cooperative grace. Erasmus wrestled mightily with the question of grace and merit described in Corinthians. He would ultimately maintain a kind of precarious balance, saying that we couldn't claim any credit for ourselves, but needed to attribute everything to divine grace, which seems to follow Valla's reading of Corinthians. But Erasmus then adds that even though grace is itself sufficient and has no need of the assistance of human will, our will is what he calls a synergos, a co-worker with grace, whereby he preserves the reading from the Vulgate. So he's made a kind of compromise. But of course, who should be looming on the horizon but Martin Luther. And Luther would embrace a number of Valla's corrections, including that of 1 Corinthians 15.10 which formed the basis of his teachings regarding grace, faith, and the will, the basis, therefore, of the Protestant Reformation. That's another story, but a huge one that will, of course, dominate the political and religious life of the next few centuries at least, and one that, in this respect, in its new readings of the Bible, in its belief that the Word of God, as transmitted to us, is something open to philological investigation, can be traced back to Italy, to Valla and Minetti, to their toils in the Vatican, and to the Renaissance project, because it was nothing less than that, of trying to go back to the original sources and give a better reading of the biblical text based on a superior understanding of languages and of history. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to watch more. And please, if you want to know more about Genozzo Minetti, and especially if you want to know more about Vespasiano da Bistici, you must do yourself the favor of purchasing and reading my latest book, The Bookseller of Florence, available in your favorite bookstore.